life processes and this is a very interesting concept we live we breathe we walk we do daily activities and how is all that possible it's really interesting to understand in this lecture we would focus on the living organisms characteristics that differentiate a living organism from a non living organism and then we would move forward to understand four major life processes and those are nutrition respiration transportation and excretion so let's begin understanding first of all the differences between a living organism versus a non living organism living organism can be characterized by acute mnemonic which is mrs gren where m stands for movement r stands for respiration s stands for sensitivity so a organism which is living would be able to move it's not required that the movement is physically from one location to another location but there is movement of nutrients in the plant itself Mu movement of nutrients movement of water that takes place in the plants you might ask a question the plant do not appear to move then how does the movement take place and that is something we would address in a while the next is the process of respiration again interesting occurs both in plants and animals and then we focus on sensitivity that is response to a stimuli the next is gren now gren stands for growth reproduction excretion and nutrition so these are seven basic characteristics of a living organism whenever we are talking about molecular movements we say the organism is living and therefore it's a hard time to differentiate or classify viruses because viruses do not have any molecular movement they have a molecular movement only once they infect and therefore there is always a controversy whether to classify viruses as living or to classify viruses as non living we would also understand that each of the organisms as we have seen in our lower classes that there is tissue then tissues have cell and within cell we have the nucleus and other components so this can be compared to a building and that's very much a reality we have a organ within the organ there are organ systems so similarly there is a society society has buildings building has apartment and apartment has certain rooms now there can be a category of slum where you can say there is just one room where the family dwells or there could be a villa or a bungalow where you have numerous rooms and each of the family members might be allotted a separate room or might be shared with few of the family members but the concept here is we are focusing on either a single celled organism or a multicellular organism single celled organism all the functions are performed by a single cell be it the process of excretion reproduction be it the process of growth or respiration however under multicellular organism you have different categories or different activities which are performed by different cells and similarly in a bigger house you would see there is a drawing room there is a kitchen there is a dining room so the idea is there is a uh, diversification and a uh, specialization for each of the cells or each of the rooms or each of the uh, family members that are present there so that is a very good way to understand and develop a visualization how we classify and understand a living organism so these life processes are very very important most of the life processes occur through a process of oxidation reduction so cells utilize oxygen and this is the process of cellular respiration as we know and through this you have the life processes that actually take place but maintenance of life process is equally important consider that you purchase a house and you have been there for last 10 years definitely in the last 10 years you would see there is either a dilapidation of the building that is taken uh, taken on or there is certain damage in the infrastructure there could be damage in the pipelines so there can be different cases which require repair 
same happens with the cell of an organism the cells of an organism require constant repair and it is interesting that the body is capable of self repairing and sometimes when the self repair does not work well there is medical assistance that is required so let's begin our journey today with four of the major processes as we said let's first dive into the process of nutrition and we pr uh, promise that after you finish this lecture on nutrition you would be well able to understand the differences of the process of nutrition in a plant versus an animal now plants have a unique capability to produce their own food through the process of photosynthesis that is occurring in presence of sunlight and due to the green pigment which is chlorophyll and this green pigment chlorophyll is present where it is present in the chloroplast of the cell again it's important most of the leaves have chloroplast on the upper surface so that maximum process of photosynthesis can easily take place plants are classified as autotrophs that means they are capable of producing their own food in presence of sunlight so these plants absorb carbon dioxide and take water from the soil and by the process which occurs during the sunlight it's very very important during the sunlight during the day you have the process of photosynthesis that occurs in the plant and manufacturing of glucose and a waste product which is oxygen for plants not for human beings of course is produced now this process is the basic process through which plant get the food which is glucose and a by product is released which is oxygen and this release of oxygen is further utilized by human beings and therefore this ecological cycle is maintained now again how does this process of photosynthesis actually take place so photosynthesis occurs where you have uh, the process of intake of carbon dioxide and this occurs where this occurs through the stomata stomata are the smaller openings which are present on the leaf surface and these are guarded by the guard cell so when they intake there is expansion that occurs and when they uh, release there is contraction that occurs exchange of gases in the case of plants occurs through stomata it also occurs through the surface of the stems the roots as well as the leaves so all of these plant parts are involved in exchange of gases so that is a very fundamental understanding of nutrition when it occurs in case of plants again it is very very important that the plant produce is being utilized by higher order organisms and those are classified as heterotrophs these heterotrophs do not have a capability to produce their own food and as a result they depend on autotrophs or another heterotrophs for their survival now these heterotrophs can consume food in two ways either they can take the food and digest it within the body or they can break down the food outside and then consume it a good example of breaking down the food outside and consuming it is uh, bread molds yeast then you have mushrooms however human beings ingest the food and break down uh, the food within the body so there are various mechanisms again there are parasitic organisms which act as a parasite on another organisms for example cascata you have uh, leeches and tapeworm so these are some of the good examples before we proceed with nutrition in animals let's have some quick questions to go through and revise this section on nutrition in plants the first question is let's say i plot i bought a plant which is a very healthy plant in one of the green areas but i rub all the leaves with vaseline now when i am rubbing all the leaves with vaseline what would actually happen what do you think should happen because of the vaseline coating there would be no oxygen for respiration 
there would be no carbon dioxide available for photosynthesis because the pores would be blocked and therefore the plant life would decline. So that is one of the uh, cases that we see. The second case is, let's say a plant is releasing more of uh, carbon dioxide and, and is intaking oxygen. Now, what is this phenomena? You might get confused, but the fact is plant also intake oxygen. And this intake is because of the process of respiration that occurs in plant, which we would understand in our next section within this lecture. The idea is when they respire, they intake oxygen and release carbon dioxide and this happens mainly during the night time and therefore it's mainly recommended it's not a good idea to sleep beneath a tree during the night time because during the night time the process of respiration is at its peak or it's much more active and there is no photosynthesis so there is higher amount of carbon dioxide being released in the region of the uh, in the region or the vicinity of the plants however during the day there is higher release of oxygen so if you are trying to take shelter under uh, under the shade of a tree it's a good idea to have a rest during the daytime the next is why leaves have certain adaptations for photosynthesis and what are those adaptations definitely if you look onto most of the plants the leaves do not overlap one over the other they are either arranged at right angle or at some angle to ensure that each of the leaf is receiving significant amount of sunlight the next is leaf usually have a larger surface area so it's a kind of bigger surface area when you have a leaf here you would understand there is a bigger surface area it's not just a spine or a, a, a or a thorn that is seen so surface area is enhanced and this helps in maximum absorption of light also you would have huge number of chloroplasts that are present a good network of veins that is available so those are some of the specific benefits of nutrition uh, of uh, the process of uh, nutrition in case of plants coming on to nutrition in animals let's first understand the lower order organism what happens in the case of amoeba in the case of amoeba you have a pseudopodia which is called pseudo means false podia means leg so amoeba has false leg it does not have a fixed shape of the leg it changes its shape according to the need. So whenever there is a food vacuum that is present, the amoeba would slowly engulf it and digest it. And that's the process of engulfing the food in case of amoeba. In case of paramecium, there is a groove that is present. So across the body of the paramecium, you would have small cilia, which basically divert the food particle towards the food groove. And once the particle reaches the groove, it is engulfed by the paramecium. So those are simple ways to understand the nutrition in lower order organisms. Coming on to nutrition in higher order organism, we would understand the digestive system but before we begin with that let's understand a very simple question and i have an experiment for you i have some cooked rice here and i add few drops of iodine to it what would happen the color would change to blue black and this indicates the presence of what this indicates the presence of starch so when we are trying to digest the food there is digestion of starch there is digestion of carbohydrate fats and proteins that occurs in the human body coming on to the system of digestion in humans so the food is engulfed through the mouth now in the mouth saliva basically softens the food and lubricates it so that it moves easily through the food pipe or the esophagus the movement through which the food moves down to the stomach is known as the process of peristalsis and the food balls that are created so that they smoothly run down are known as bolus. Once the food reaches the stomach, you have the gastric juices that are released in the stomach. Now in stomach, 
this gastric juices usually account for three things that we would understand one is the acid the hydrochloric acid that is released in the stomach the next is the mucus and the third is the uh, enzyme which is pepsin which helps to break down the protein now as soon as the food enters HCL or the hydrochloric acid starts to act and this acidic medium facilitates the enzyme pepsin. This pepsin starts to break down the protein that is present in the food. Now when the protein is being broken it's very very important to understand that the acid can destroy the lining of the stomach and therefore mucus is there to prevent the damage to the stomach wall the next is the movement of the absorbed or the simplified food particles to the small intestine small intestine is the place where you have most of the digestion that takes place and there are small uh, bends and curvatures that are seen which are known as villi the idea of this villi is to increase the surface area for absorption so most of the material is absorbed through the small intestine and the acidic medium which was present in the stomach now turns into an alkaline medium for the pancreatic enzymes to act and here you have two major functions that occurs first is emulsification of fat which is breaking down of fat into smaller globules that are present and trypsin is which acts for digestion of protein and lipase acts for digestion of fat so most of the protein is digested in the stomach but whatever protein is left is now digested in the small intestine through trypsin through the action of trypsin and fat being digested by lipase which is emulsification of fat taking place, breaking down the bigger flat fat molecules into smaller fat molecules or globules so that they are easier to be absorbed. Once this whole process of absorption takes place, the, uh, the remaining food then moves into the large intestine and finally through the anal sphincter into the anus and that is the medium for excretion. Now this whole process of digestion is really interesting but I have a very simple question for you. I have two organisms here. I have a cow and I have a lion. Which of the two organisms do you think would have a larger small intestine or both would have an equal small intestine? The idea here is herbivorous organisms have a larger small intestine. You might ask why? The answer is very very simple. As we have seen in our previous lectures, plant cell and animal cell are different in the fact that plant cells have cell wall. Now since these plant cells have cell wall, the cell wall is made up of cellulose. Now digestion of cellulose is difficult and therefore uh, herbivores organisms which are dependent on plant would have longer small intestine in order to digest that cellulose nicely. In contrast to that the carnivorous animals would usually have smaller small intestine. So that was one of the interesting facts that you must and must know before we proceed to the next, uh, next section. And also, uh, when we have talked about the digestive system, it's important to understand the process starts where the process starts in the mouth. Now, since the process starts in the mouth, if the food particles remain in the mouth for a prolonged period of time, usually we say during the night, what happens is there is softening of the animal and the dentine, which are the layers of the tooth uh, itself, which we have covered in the separate lecture. Now, this affects the health of the teeth causes softening and finally demineralizes the enamel which is one of the major reasons for caries or dental caries that occur. Coming on to our next topic and that is respiration. The process of respiration is indeed very very interesting but before we begin with that I have a simple experiment for you. I have a test tube here it is filled with freshly prepared lime water. 
Now don't get confused. This is not a lime water from lemon. This is a lime water which is saturated calcium hydroxide solution and it is freshly prepared because we would understand that in a while why. Now through this freshly prepared lime water which is transparent, I am just blowing out the air. What would happen? Over the time you would see that this freshly prepared lime water turns out to be milky. Why? This is because of the reaction or the action with cal uh, carbon dioxide, the calcium hydroxide that is present reacts with cal uh, carbon dioxide to produce calcium carbonate which is the reason it turns milky. And that is why I said it is a freshly prepared lime water because if you leave it for a while, the natural atmospheric carbon dioxide would be absorbed and it would turn milky automatically. However, it would take a little longer time to turn milky. The next important thing that we understand is another experiment that we would understand in a while. But before that, when we talk about the process of respiration, be it the plants or the animals, glucose is one with, through which you have uh, the ATP energy that is produced and this glucose which is a six carbon molecule is simplified into pyruvate which is three carbon molecule. Now once it is simplified into a three carbon molecule uh, there can be an aerobic process and an anaerobic process. Anaerobic process is a process which does not require oxygen. Aerobic processes require oxygen. So when there is lack of oxygen or absence of oxygen as in the case of yeast what would happen? It would further break down this pyruvate would break down into ethanol carbon dioxide and energy. However when there is oxygen that is present as in human beings as in mitochondria we would say Ah, this pyruvate would break down into carbon dioxide, water and energy. The same process occurs both in plants and animals. So you have aerobic respiration that occurs in plants and human beings. The next is sometimes there is not sufficient oxygen that is present. Usually the case of our muscle cells when we are doing rigorous exercises, what happens is this pyruvate breaks down into lactic acid, which is again a three carbon molecule and energy and that is one of the reasons where we uh, understand that uh, there is uh, fatigue or cramps in the muscles that are usually seen with excessive or vigorous exercises that are done. Now coming on to the concept of respiration as we said there is a process of photosynthesis that occurs in the plant but there is respiration as well. They require oxygen for survival. So that process occurs during the day as well as the night but in night that process uh, gets a greater uh, strength because there is no process of photosynthesis of course. Photosynthesis occurs in the day. Photosynthesis is a process through which Plants prepare their food. Respiration is the process through which they actually take in oxygen and this is done through the mitochondria. What do you think would happen to the fishes living in the ocean? How do they actually survive? Don't they require the oxygen? So what do you think would be the scenario in that case? So right. Here we understand that these aquatic organisms, be it fishes or any other aquatic organisms, they respire by the dissolved oxygen that is present in the water and this dissolved oxygen is being absorbed by or is being utilized by the aquatic organisms but since the concentration is low they require a lot of effort and therefore the rate of breathing is higher. So if I compare a fish with let's say a deer, you would understand that the breathing rate is much faster in case of a fish as compared to a deer. The reason being that they are trying to utilize the dissolved oxygen that is present. So that was about the respiration. 
Coming on to the process of respiration in human beings is further interesting. So what we are trying to do is we try to inhale the oxygen which is being released by the plants due to the process of photosynthesis. Now this oxygen enters through the nostrils. Nostrils have fine hairs that are present which do not allow the dust particle to enter in and you have the oxygen that moves into the system. Now this oxygen actually moves down through the trachea and enters into the lungs, the bronchioles and finally goes to the alveoli. Alveoli are the lowest level where you actually have the process of exchange of gas that occurs and this is a strong network of capillaries that are seen in the alveoli and this helps in removal of carbon dioxide from the body. Now as the alveoli act in the lungs in a respiratory system similarly you have nephrons that act in the excretory system both of these are targeted to eliminating the waste from the body. Alveoli aims to eliminate the carbon dioxide waste from the body. However, nephrons eliminate nitrogenous waste or urea or uric acid, uric acid in case of birds, urea in case of mammals from uh, the body. So the function of both the, uh, both the organs uh, are similar and there is another interesting common commonality we would say that exists and that is both of them have a rich network of uh, blood capillaries that are present. So this process is really really interesting. I have an interesting fact with you. If we were relying only on the process of diffusion the oxygen would take nearly three years, nearly three years to reach from toe to lungs. But with the process of oxygen being binding to hemoglobin, which is present in the blood, this rate increases. And therefore, it does not take three years to circulate. So it's again important how uh, with the blood, the movement, actually the movement of dissolved oxygen gets strengthened. So this process of respiration in human beings is really interesting. And lungs always have a residual volume. We would understand the various volumes uh, in the further higher classes. But for now, the idea is lungs always have a residual amount of air that is present so that there is sufficient oxygen that is absorbed. And for that, there is certain amount of carbon dioxide that is being released. Lungs are also very, very important and essential part when it comes to the process of transportation or the process of circulatory system that we would understand next. So coming on to the process of circulatory system. Now circulatory system occurs through blood. Blood is one of the major connective tissues and blood consists of a fluid medium which is plasma. Within the plasma you have cells that are suspended and these cells are the RBCs, WBCs and platelets. Now if you, there is an injury, after some time even if you do not compress it a lot you would see there is clotting that occurs and this is a natural process that occurs because of the platelets that are present in the blood. Similarly WBC the white blood corpuscles are present to strengthen the immunity and RBCs the red blood corpuscles have the heme or the hemoglobin that is present and that binds to oxygen and that is important for the process of uh, uh, cleaning of the uh, air that is coming into the body. Now what happens in heart? In heart we have a four chambered heart. Again it's very important human beings or mammals have a four chambered heart. Fishes have a two chambered heart 
and uh, reptiles have a three chambered heart with an exception of crocodile having a four chambered heart as we have done in our animal classification the idea here is in fishes there is single circulation that occurs that means the blood moves through the heart only once however in a four chambered heart as in human beings there is a process of double circulation that occurs what does this mean you have two auricles and two ventricles the process occurs twice the blood moves twice through the auricles and twice through the ventricles and how does it happen so the fresh blood or the blood rich in oxygen moves to the iota from the lungs the purified blood enters into the uh, left auricle and from the left auricle it moves to the left ventricle from the left ventricle it is supplied to the whole body now the impure blood moves to the right auricle or the right atrium and from the right atrium it moves to the right ventricle and from the right ventricle the impure blood moves to the lungs for the process of purification now how does it move from the lungs it goes through the pulmonary artery a lot of students have confusion regarding what is artery to clarify it right away a very easy way to remember a for artery a for away that means arteries take the blood away from heart it's not required that arteries carry only pure blood because pulmonary artery is a artery which carries impure blood and it carries the impure blood from heart to the lungs for the process of purification but it is taking the uh taking the blood away from the heart and therefore the best way to remember is a for artery a for away so it always takes the blood away from the heart again arteries have elastic and thick walls because the pressure is much more higher in case of arteries there is pure blood again when we talk, compare the auricles and the ventricles of the heart the ventricles of the heart have a thick muscle the auricles and the ventricles are separated or i could say uh, the left heart the auricles and the ventricles are separated by the walls the bicuspid and the tricuspid wall that is present and again the left half is separated from the right half of the heart and that is through septa so that is a basic understanding of the transportation process that occurs in human being i repeat again some of the key highlights arteries take the blood away from the heart they are elastic they are uh, basically thick walled however ventricles are thick walled so within the four chambers of the heart ventricles have thick muscle, muscles however as compared to arteries and veins arteries have thicker uh, thicker muscles okay the next important concept that we understand is whenever we are trying to understand the pressure of the blood we understand it through the arteries not through the veins there is the process of contraction and relaxation that occurs the process of contraction is known as systolic uh, pressure and the relaxation is known as diastolic pressure so the systolic and the diastolic pressure is important the diastolic pressure which is the pressure during the relaxing is 80 mm of uh, mercury however during the contraction it is 120 mm of mercury and this is a standard blood pressure that is called as if the blood pressure is higher than this it is called as hypertension because there is increased resistance for the flow of blood that is being offered so that is a general idea to understand the process of blood pressure blood pressure is measured by an instrument which is known as siphonometer the next important thing that we would understand is the process of transpiration uh, transportation in plants we have understood the process of transportation 
or the process of circulation that occurs in animals mainly the human beings and coming on to plants now plants they obviously do not move but there is movement or transportation of uh, nutrients transportation of water minerals that occurs in the plant and how does this occur this occurs through the xylem and the phloem so xylem basically takes all the material from the roots through the vessels and the trachea to the plant part and supplies the water and the nutrient to the plant once the leaves produce the finished food it is transported to the various uh, parts of the plant by phloem so there is where we understand the role of xylem and phloem in our previous lectures we have already understood the components of xylem and components of phloem so we won't go into that detail again but to make uh, the things very very clear we know few of the facts about plants plants do not move plants have a huge number of dead cells be it the bark of the plant be it uh, the drying of the leaves that are seen and there is where you have lot of excretion that is seen and therefore uh, a relatively slow transport system would work well however if the tree is huge if the tree is big you would require a uh, movement to far off regions of the tree and therefore the process is further needs to be strengthened so those are some of the key things that we need to understand in the process of transportation in case of plants however as we said when it comes to xylem there is the movement uh, where uh, soil and water and the plant roots are related and there is active uptake of ions that occurs this creates a difference in the concentration of ions which are present in the root and below the root or in the soil and therefore movement actually occurs in order to eliminate that difference that is there and there is a kind of upward movement with the help of xylem that occurs again in the plants we observe the process of transpiration which is loss of water loss of water occurs from the leaves that is seen again why it is important if there is no loss of water there would be no cooling effect and as a result no thermal regulation and the heat uh, and the leaves would actually dry up heat up and dry up in order to prevent that transpiration is a very essential part of plants and we have seen in the case of water cycle how the process of evaporation and transpiration together helps in the formation of water vapor and building up of the clouds to maintain the water cycle so it's therefore called as a process of evapotranspiration evaporation from the ocean bodies and the lakes and transpiration from the plants so transpiration is indeed a very very important essential part helps in thermal regulation helps in loss of water from the aerial plants and upward movement and absorption of minerals in the plant also the process of absorption of the processed food material across the plant occurs through translocation which is done through phloem as we have already understood and this happens with the changes in the osmotic pressure in the cell and with the changes in the osmotic pressure in the cell this process of translocation is further strengthened now another important thing that we need to understand is excretion so excretion is another important life activity or an activity of a living organism we would understand excretion both in human beings as well as in plants the idea here is let's first talk about plants for plants oxygen itself is a excretion because during the process of photosynthesis oxygen is a by product and that is being released into the atmosphere because it is a waste for the plant it is, some of it is required for the process of respiration the rest of it is being thrown away by the plant the plant also gets rid of excess water through the process of transpiration also a uh, lot of plant waste is stored in the cells of uh, the vacuoles of the mesophyll cells and therefore when the leaves die off uh, these uh these uh, remaining parts are excreted through the drying off of the leaves so uh, the mesophyll cells the vacuoles of the mesophyll cell actually store a lot of waste product so that was about the excretion in case of plants coming on to animals or human beings 
human beings the process of excretion occurs through a pair of kidney this pair of kidney is connected to a ureter uh, to a pair of ureter finally emptying into urethra and uh, urinary bladder and from the urinary bladder into the urethra which is the exit point for the urine now this kidneys are made up of what as we have discussed previously they are made up of nephrons similar to the lungs which are made up of alveoli these nephrons are rich in capillaries blood capillaries and the process of absorption takes place so if we dive into the structure of nephrons we would have a bowman's capsule that is present which is connected to a tubular part of the nephron there is a glomerulus that is present uh, the details of the nephron we would be understanding in higher higher lectures but the idea is this uh intake uh, or the flow that occurs through each of the nephrons helps in absorption and selective reabsorption of urine where most of uh, the water the nutrients are being absorbed and the remaining nitrogenous waste which is mainly in the form of urea is being excreted so that is where uh, the collecting duct actually collects the remaining or the unabsorbed uh, urine that is present so selective absorption is one of the major functions of the uh, uh, the tubular part of the nephron which acts for reabsorbing of the nutrients that are present but there are cases where actually the kidneys fail to work in human beings because kidneys are vital for the process of excretion and elimination of waste as we have understood the elimination of waste in the form of carbon dioxide occurs through lungs but the nitrogenous waste is being released through kidneys if this kidneys are not functioning properly there is a condition which is known as dialysis and this a process of dialysis does the filtration of the waste and how does it does there is a kind of permeable chamber that is present the blood is being blood from the artery is being put into the pipe through that uh, selective membrane which is in the dialysis solution and from that the used dilute uh, the used solution is removed and the remaining blood is again pumped in to the body and that is how the process of uh, dialysis actually takes place in an healthy adult we say kidneys have an capacity to filter nearly 180 liters per day however the actual volume that is excreted is just 1 to 2 liters in a day but the filtration amount in the kidneys is much much higher so this was about the basic life processes that we have understood today as we had promised in the beginning of the lecture we have covered four of the important life processes the process of nutrition the autotrophs and the heterotrophs the process of respiration in the plants which is through photosynthesis in the animals and the humans which is through the process of respiratory system then we focused on the transportation system in plants it is through xylem and phloem and in animals through the process of circulatory system and finally the process of excretion where we focused on the role of kidneys and the excretory system in human beings versus the process of excretion in uh, in the plants and that is the elimination of oxygen and excess water supply and the dead decaying of the leaves that we have seen so this was about the life processes how living organisms differ from non living organisms how we compared it to a society and understood how each of the elements have a very integral role in having a life processes and sustaining of the life and in a complex multicellular organism like plants or human beings you have specialized cells that are present for specific purposes so in plants there are xylem phloem stomata uh, chloroplast for various purposes and similarly in human beings you have the circulate organs which deal with circulatory system respiratory system excretory system and so on the details of each of these systems we have covered separately and further would be covering more of those with higher standards as we go stay tuned for many more updates from our side have a wonderful day i